Hi, my name is Phil and I'm a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln and I want to use this video to show you how you can basically derive the equation for equilibrium temperature of a planet. We'll kind of use Earth here as an example because it's a pretty good example. We kind of know how hot it is, things like that. So what is the equilibrium temperature of a planet? Well, it's the temperature of a planet if it were a perfect black body. So that basically means that it's balancing the absorbed energy from the star and then emitting energy from the star. So basically it's absorbing some energy and then it's emitting it and it's in a balance basically. So what are we gonna start with? Well, the first thing we need to start with is essentially the power carried by the sunlight or the starlight. If we're gonna use Earth as an example or the solar system, we'll refer to it as sunlight, but it could just be the starlight, the power and the stellar light essentially. So this here, is given as a function of the luminosity of the sun and the distance of the planet from the sun. So just to give you a bit of a visual idea then really, the top one there, the L, that symbol, which is the circle and the dot here, basically means that it's a solar unit. So if you had R there with the circle and the dot, that means it's a solar radius, things like that. So basically here, we've got the, the solar luminosity, that's basically the power emitted by the sun, and that's divided by four pi times d squared, where d is the distance of the planet from the sun. Now we know the average distance of the Earth from the sun, it's about one AU, but we could do this for any other planet basically. So now what we need is we need the cross-sectional area of the planet. Now we know that planets are not flat, despite what some people might say. Um, it's spherical or thereabouts essentially, but the way that it intercepts the sunlight, it causes a cross-sectional area to intercept that, which is essentially the area of a circle with a radius, that of the Earth. So the cross-sectional area is just the, the area of the Earth from its radius, so pi r squared essentially, which is so RP here is the radius of the planet or the radius of Earth if we're going to use that. So we've got the cross-sectional area. So this is, yeah, just again to give you a visual idea, this is the area that intercepts the sunlight and depending on where it is from the actual sun or the star, it's going to intercept different amounts of power. The closer that it is, then it's obviously going to, it's going to have a higher power density or energy density closer to the star because as you get further away it dissipates over a, uh, a larger volume essentially. So this is the area that intercepts the sunlight. So now what we then need to do is we need to combine the equation for the cross-sectional area of our planet which we just had and the power carried by the sunlight because that's going to give us the actual amount of power that is absorbed by the planet. So now we combine those. Now what you'll find here is if we put the cross-sectional area times by the luminosity at the top, then our pi gets cancelled. There's a pi on the bottom, pi on the top, they get cancelled. So we're left with that bottom one there, which is the power absorbed by the planet. Now that's it there, that's our power absorbed. So we've essentially got the distance of the planet from the star, the radius of the planet, and the luminosity of the sun or the star. We could rewrite that for the star, doesn't matter. So it should make perfect sense here that if you had a more luminous star, then the power absorbed by the planet would be greater. If it was a bigger planet, it would absorb more energy. If it was closer, more energy. So you can see how you're gonna get hotter planets basically. Okay, however, the key thing really to note here is that the planet doesn't absorb all that energy, it does reflect some. Now this is known as the albedo of the planet and it's essentially the reflectivity of the planet. Now for example, something like if it was a frozen surface, let's say we we're going through an ice age on Earth, that actually would reflect more light than it would do if the planet was much hotter. So it depends on how reflective it is. Ice is quite reflective relative to you know just normal soil I suppose, rock, whatever. So we need to put this factor in here because some of it's going to get reflected back and this is just a dimensionless number A here, the albedo. So now what we need to consider is the power radiated per square meter from the surface of the planet 
we can then use the Stefan Boltzmann law for a black body. This is given here, so the power radiator then is the Stefan Boltzmann constant times the temperature to the fourth power. So depending on how hot this um, black body is, or this planet, again, we're assuming it's a, a perfect black body here, then the power radiated is a function of the temperature to the fourth power. So as you increase temperature, the power radiated obviously increases to that um, respect. So we've got that. However, same as that with the albedo, a planet is not a perfect black body. So we need to include emissivity. And if I pronounce that right, either way, this is a measure of its effectiveness in emitting energy as thermal radiation. So again, there's a factor in there due to how efficient it is at actually radiating the energy. And we just need to include that basically because it's not going to be perfect. So now what do we need to do? So then the actual power radiated from the planet's surface is found by multiplying the power radiated by the surface area of the sphere. So that just gives us like per meter squared. We actually want to get it for the entire surface of the planet so we can work out all the power that's being emitted and the power that's being absorbed. So this here, so SA is going to be our surface area of a sphere and it's just four pi times the radius of that sphere squared. So what we then do is we add those to go, or sorry, not add them, we multiply those together to give us our total power radiated from the surface of the planet, which is the, the bottom one there. So we've basically got four pi radius of the planet squared, the this emissivity, Stefan Boltzmann constant and then the temperature to the fourth power. So if it's in equilibrium, that means it's balanced, the absorbed power is balancing the stuff that's being radiated away, then they, you can basically equate those two equations. So the power absorbed equals the power radiated from the sun. So we can use this here. Now we can actually go put our equations in and balance them there. So we had on the left hand side there the power absorbed by the planet and on the right hand side we had the power radiated now what you should be able to see straight away is we've got t the temperature there so what we need to do at this point is if we rearrange for t then we can actually find an equation for this equilibrium temperature of the planet so that's what we've basically done here. If we rearrange for T, we end up with this expression here, or this equation, and this gives us our equilibrium temperature of our planet. So for the solar system, we need the luminosity of the sun. We need the albedo of the planet, how reflective it is. We also need to know its distance from the sun and things like that. And then we can actually work out a temperature. Now, it's worth noting, this is actually a fairly simplified derivation. It does not include things like greenhouse gas, atmospheric effects, even variations of the albedo on the surface. And if you included all of those, you'd get a different temperature. So if, if you have a go at calculating this yourself with those values that we can find that are catalogued anywhere, you won't get the right temperature. And that's because it doesn't include like the atmospheric effects, the greenhouse effects, but it gives you kind of a baseline temperature and a way of kind of looking at the temperature in comparison to other planets, basically. So thank you for watching. And if you find the videos helpful, or you enjoy them, then do consider becoming a member. I have lots of extra videos in the member section. There's also other benefits and it just generally helps support the channel. So thank you for watching.